All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm gonna begin the lecture now. Uh, this is lecture 10. And uh, this is uh, one of three remaining taxonomy lectures. Uh, and then we're gonna move into systems uh, and fish physiology. <clears throat> so lecture 10. So let me get my pointer here. Okay, so we're gonna move into order Scorpaniformes. Uh, and so these are the scorpion fishes. Uh, Scorpaniformes is the order. So all of these fish have what's called a suborbital bony strait or strut. And so this is a posterior extension of the, the orbit around the eye that sort of reinforces the preoperculum. So uh, you'll see these kind of structures here on the, uh, the operculum. Uh, this is a characteristic of all these fishes. Sometimes it's spiny, like in a sea robins. Uh, this is, again, it's some kind of armor or protection on the head. And really the group is known as the male, like chain male cheeked fishes. So there's really pretty heavy armor here on the operculum. This is a good example here, the stonefish. Uh, very characteristic. And the body and the head are also very spiny. <clears throat> so they got a lot of heavy, uh, sharp dorsal spines. Again, this is characteristic of more advanced fishes. And again, these are armor. It makes these fishes more difficult to eat. Uh, so predators have a harder time eating them. Again, like the case here, uh, a lot of times these spines are very prominent. And so it sort of prevents another fish from eating this thing whole. Um, these sharp spines here on the dorsal fin and also then also on the head. Uh, the pectoral and caudal fins are often very rounded. Uh, in some cases you might see like this an emarginated tail, but a lot of times like in the stonefishes, it's a rounded caudal fin. The pectoral fins are almost always rounded. Um, and so this is sort of a characteristic there, rounded caudal uh, pectoral fins. In the case of the sea robins, they can be kind of elongated, but oftentimes they're rounded here at the tip. Also, this contains the world's most venomous fishes. The stone fishes, for instance, are, are, are quite venomous. Uh, 25 families, 1,200 species. Uh, these are mostly marine. There are not very many freshwater uh, fishes in this group. They're mostly marine fishes. And so when we go to our first family here again, We've just introduced order Scorpaniformes, and here we have it, family Scorpanidae. So Scorpaniformes is the order, Scorpanidae is the, the family, and the common name is the scorpion fishes. So this is a good example here. You can see, again, these prominent, sharp dorsal spines, and look at all this sharp stuff on the head all these spikes and things like that. So again, these are very heavily armored and you can really get a good then appreciation here of these rounded pectoral fins. They have a laterally compressed body, often with prominent skin appendages, uh, a lot of three-dimensional effects here. Head with ridges and spines, again, uh, dorsal fin with a notch. So the anterior dorsal close to the head, then there's a notch here. And then this posterior dorsal fin again is soft rays. Hard spines, soft rays on the posterior dorsal fin. Venom glands in the dorsal anal and pelvic spines. So sometimes the pelvic fins here will have spines that are poison or that are venomous. The anal fin will have a spine here that is venomous. And also then these dorsal spines here, not only are they sharp, but they produce venom. So if you get poked by one of these things, it hurts. 11 different subfamilies, about 388 species in family Scorpanidae. A reproductive strategy depends on the subfamily. Uh, most of the time, uh, I think the next slide will talk about this. There are some live bearers, I believe, and then there are some uh, egg-laying um, members of this family. Max length, about two feet. Diet, mostly fishes. A lot of times these are lurking predators. You can see here, it's very well camouflaged fish. And so they sort of just wait around for a prey item to swim by and then they eat it. Oh yes, Matt, remote Matt. 
you've taken you've taken one to the palm and can confirm that it indeed does not feel good. I like it. That's pretty good. So, lurking predators. They have massive mouths. Look at the size of the mouth on this thing. They can actually eat prey items that are all over half the size of the scorpion fish itself. <laughs> Ryan Burke, the same. All right, there you go. Don't get spiked by these things. Um, <clears throat> so they can swallow pretty large prey items, mostly uh, marine, rarely are they in freshwater, and they're also tropical and temperate sea distribution. So when we look at the uh, uh, reproduction of these things, there we go, advance the slide. Uh, commercially valuable, for instance, there are these rockfish here, uh, or rock cods or ocean perches. Commercially valuable primarily along the Pacific coast of the United States. The venom the, is, is kind of mild here, really. Like it, it mostly is painful. It's not going to kill you. And in this case, the rockfish are oftentimes viviparous, meaning that they have internal fertilization and they give birth to live young. So they do not lay eggs. They actually have live birth. Uh, scorpion fish like this, again, very well color uh, camouflaged. Like this one here is, is very well camouflaged there. Uh, associate mainly with tropical reefs, so their camouflage is sort of dependent upon what reefs they're living in. Venom is moderately toxic and produces painful uh, but not deadly stings, if you will. So if you, if you touch these spines, they hurt, they're not going to kill you. These are oviparous, they, they lay eggs, uh, produce floating gelatinous egg masses. And so these are egg layers, uh, whereas rockfish, for instance, are, are live bearers. So some little bit variation there in reproductive strategy. Now, here are the lionfishes, also in family Scorpionidae. day. Uh, these are native to the Indo-Pacific coral reefs, but they are actually now found in the Caribbean and the West Atlantic Ocean. Um, that's an introduction, and when we talk about uh, introductions or exotic fish species, the lionfish is kind of a poster child of this. It's, it's kind of famous here on the Atlantic coast. Uh, if you want to learn more about it, you can go check out this link here at noaa.gov, uh, lionfish on the loose. They talk about this as an exotic species um, introduced uh, down in Florida, and they've moved up the coast north, um, uh, and you can find them actually off the coast of North Carolina. So I'm going to show you, oh, uh, venom here is also moderately toxic. Look at all the spines on these things. Every one of these spines is sharp and they're poisonous. So again, very heavily armored in the sense that you don't really want to grab a hold of these things. These are also oviparous. They lay eggs, uh, floating gelatinous egg masses. So the eggs are kind of adhesive and stick together to form a floating mat. And again, they're invasive species in the East Coast of the United States. And so uh, when we look at the mouths, again, very large mouth, these things are, are capable of, uh, they're very voracious predators. And so I'm going to show you a video here of uh, lionfish feeding, and then also then I'm going to show a video here on uh, lionfish introductions and the exotic uh, nature of these things on the East Coast. So here is our lionfish uh, feeding video. So pay attention to how fast these things can swallow something. And, and how powerful their, their jaws are when they create this pipette feeding, this, this negative pressure uh, suctorial feeding. So just pay attention to that. So those are the, the lionfish feeding. And so then here is a, a video again. This is a NOAA uh, lionfish on the loose. And so you can sort of look at some of the, uh, this website for more information about lionfish. 
But here is a video then that we can watch. Lurking in the waters of the Western Atlantic is an unwelcome predator. A predator that is beautiful, yet deadly. A stealthy ambush predator with venomous spines. Potential prey fall easy victim to the red lionfish. The lionfish is an invader far from its home on coral reefs in the Indo-Pacific Basin. The mystery of how they got here has slowly unraveled. A showy species for personal aquariums, they were likely dumped off the Florida coast when no longer wanted. Several small releases of lionfish have led to a population explosion that has increased 1,000% in less than five years and they are now found throughout the Caribbean, along the U.S. coast to Long Island, and east to Bermuda. The warm waters of the Gulf Stream allow lionfish to survive in these areas. Like most invasive species, lionfish are wreaking havoc in their new habitat. They prey on a wide variety of native species, including young commercially important fish like snapper, grouper, and sea bass. If left unchecked, this could impact local fisheries. Lionfish also compete for the same resources as native fish, which may slowly edge them out and reduce the biodiversity of the ecosystem. Local eradication efforts may slow the invasion but there is no way to get rid of them completely. Lionfish in the Atlantic are here to stay. There is a lesson to be learned, whether on land or in the water. Invasive species put native ones at risk and upset the fragile balance of an ecosystem. By educating the public about lionfish, marine biologists hope to prevent future invasions. So that is the invasive lionfish. And again, another example of why if you've got an aquarium fish uh, and, and you don't want it anymore, don't release it into the wild because that's sort of how these, these things that got established because people were releasing them in Florida from their aquariums. And uh, they've caused a major problem. So. Again, as much as it might sound terrible, if you got to get rid of your aquarium fish, either give them to an uh, a pet store, or donate them, or uh, you know, kill them. Florida man strikes again. <laughs> That's pretty good. And yes, uh, uh, Annika, I've gotten lionfish things before. Probably not as bad as scorpion fish, but not fun. That's what we're all going to do over the weekend. Everyone wants. I want everyone to go out and get stung by one of these things and tell me, tell me how it feels. You're going to have an essay you can write about this. And so, uh, you know what you don't want to get stung by is, is one of these. Let me see if my slide is advancing. One of these here, the stonefish. Uh, look at this. This is, this is someone's foot that swelled up after they stepped on a stonefish. So, these are also in the Indo-Pacific on soft bottoms near reefs. So look at this, a bunch of shells or sand. Again, very well camouflaged here. It's hard to see these things. We can see the eyes here, and this is the mouth. Very well camouflaged. Venom apparatus is highly modified, and venom is highly toxic neurotoxin. In these cases, uh, they can either cause major swelling or necritis or uh, necrotic tissue, or in some cases can be fatal. Uh, no one really knows. We think that these things broadcast spawn, so they lay their eggs and there's external fertilization. And there are skin glands present. Look at these warts all over the body. 
In some cases, there are encrusting organisms that attach to the body to aid in the camouflage, and, and, and the skin can be shed periodically. So again, this, a, lot, a lot of this has to do with creating a good three-dimensional kind of, looks like a rock, right? I, I, I mean, they could have called this rockfish, but they already used rockfish for something else. So rocks or stones, let's call it a stonefish. Looks kind of like stones. So very well camouflaged. And so these ones here, you definitely don't want to step on because they can be uh, deadly, if not painful. And the way that the venom works is like this. So <clears throat> whether it's a lionfish or a stonefish or a scorpion fish, uh, there is this dorsal spine, right? This is part of the dorsal fin. And then there's this skin, integumentary skin sheath that sort of lines the out, it sort of covers this spine. And then there's a channel in here, uh, like this, a little bit of a channel in here. And what happens is, is there's, this pocket is filled with the venom. So what happens is if you put your hand on this, uh, the spine uh, penetrates your hand, and then this skin sort of peels off of it, releasing that venom into your wound. So as this thing is spining into something, the skin sort of peels back off of it, releasing the venom into the wound. And so you can sort of see this, this person has pulled that skin back. And so here's the spine, it's very sharp, and then it's coated with venom. And so the stonefish, for instance, has a very big venom gland associated with this because it's really pumping out some nasty stuff that you don't want to, you don't want to get inside of your body. And here is the scorpion fish. Again, this sort of channel in here, there's a venom gland in there that's producing venom. But in both cases, in all three cases, there's a skin sheath that then peels away as you're uh, stepping on this, for instance. Uh, and that skin peels away, releasing the venom as this spine then penetrates. So that's sort of how this works. And so again, this is really for self-defense. Nothing really wants to bite onto this uh, lionfish because it's just coated with these venomous spines. So that's sort of how they work. So uh, the next family we'll talk about here is family Triglidae, the sea robins. So uh, again, in scorpaniformes, uh, characteristic round pectoral fin, uh, kind of heavy armor on the head. These things have really got heavy bony heads. And again, a lot of times sharp, sharp spikes and spines and things like that. Some cases, these things go right down the side of the body. So kind of heavily armored. Again, a throwback in the sense that these are a lot more heavily armored than a lot of the other fishes we've seen. The dorsal fins are completely separate. So the anterior dorsal fin has got hard spines in it. Posterior dorsal fin is soft raised. Uh, very bony head. And the pectoral fins are very wing-like. And oftentimes, these things can be brightly colored. Now, two to three of these rays of their pectoral fin are enlarged and free. Look at, there's no, there's no fin webbing here. And these actually are legs. The sea robins will actually walk around on these kind of like a spider or an insect. And I'm going to show a video of that. They literally will walk around on these modified, these, these spines that are modified from their pectoral fin. Uh, mouth is inferior. It, oftentimes it feeds here on soft uh, substrates uh, on the bottom. These things are quite benthic. Um, they can vibrate their swim bladder to make noises. And so again, like some of these other fishes, like the grunts, uh, these things are able to uh, make noises with the swim bladder. Two families. They're the really heavily armored sea robins, like this one down here. These are a bit heavy bony plates on the body found in deep waters on tropical continental slopes. And then we have the, the unarmored sea robins. And even then, these things still have a pretty heavy bony head. So I'd say they, they call them unarmored. They're really more like uh, moderately armored, maybe. Uh, those are found in shallow shelf waters. In, all, in total, about 170 species. They all broadcast spawn. They lay their eggs, external fertilization, really not a lot of parental care. Max length, about three and a half feet. Diet, shrimp, crab, amphipods, squids, bivalves, mollusks, worms, and other small fishes. Again, mostly benthic. These things crawl around on the bottom. 
they can use their fins to swim, but oftentimes they're walking around on the bottom. And so overall, the family is marine. Uh, they're found in all tropical and temperate seas. Uh, not any freshwater species that I'm aware of. So marine. So when we talk about brightly colored, here come some local examples to North Carolina. The big head sea robin, Prionotus is the genus. Look at how brightly colored these big round pectoral fins are. Uh, and again, it's walking around here on the substrate. Um, here's the striped sea robin. Again, genus Prionotus. These are a little bit more drab, but you can sort of see again, very distinctly separated dorsal fins. Anterior hard spines, posterior soft rays. Uh, here is uh, the leopard sea robin. And again, you can sort of see these modified, these three modified uh, pectoral fin uh, spines that are modified into legs. And then here is the northern sea robin. And those, those little legs are tucked up underneath it when it's swimming. So when it's free swimming in the water column, it, it tucks the legs up. Uh, and so this is the uh, Prionotus carolinus, the northern sea robin. And so here's a video now of sea robins uh, walking around on the bottom. And you can see these things are pretty crazy. Uh, they literally walk on the bottom. Look at that. Like I said, it's like a spider or an insect. Or a crab even. But they, they literally walk around on those those spines like, like legs. You can see they, they can move pretty quick. So that is the sea robins, family Triglidae. They're actually, I think that they're pretty cool. Um, diagnostic key feature there again are these modified pectoral fins that are spines that they can use to walk around. I mean, that's pretty distinct. They've literally got six legs, three on each side. So family Cotidae. Uh, I like family Cotidae. For me, it's always a pretty easy one to remember. Uh, they're, they're the sculpins. And so here's Cotus carolinus or Carolina, uh, the, the banded sculpin. And again, these things have features similar to the, uh, the rock, the stone fishes, uh, very well camouflaged kind of benthic. So a lot of these fishes, the triglidae, the, the sea robins are benthic. These things are as well. Large head and mouth. Again, these things oftentimes have a very large head. They take advantage of eating a lot of variety of things. Uh, eyes are large and placed pretty high up on the head. So you can see they're almost a dorsal, dorsally placed eyes. Large, again, large fan-like pectoral fins, oftentimes rounded uh, as characteristic of the order. Uh, front of the body is wide, and then it sort of tapers down to a kind of very slender tail, very narrow caudal peduncle. Uh, benthic feeders uh, on invertebrates is really what they're preying on. The coloration is black, brown, beige. They're very well camouflaged. And so you can sort of see here uh, stripe patterns, these mottled kind of earthen tones to blend in with rocks and substrate. In some cases, kind of dark colors, again, to blend in with the substrate. Some freshwater species are threatened. For instance, the Bannock scope in, in North Carolina is, is threatened. About 300 species total. Uh, males guard the nest. So these things uh, have external fertilization. They lay eggs, but they actually create a nest. And the male then guards the nest cavity, which is usually a, a, a clump of adhesive eggs. So when the female lays her eggs, the male fertilizes them, and the eggs sort of adhere they're adhesive, they sort of stick to one another to form these clumps. And then the male will sit there and guard them uh, until they hatch. <clears throat> Max length, uh, two and a half feet. Um, most are in the two to 10 inch long range. So sculpins are actually relatively small. Like this is one of the bigger ones. Most of these guys are, are, are two to 10 inches in length. And again, diet, 
They're benthic. They're eating aquatic invertebrates, in some cases, small fishes, but they sort of hunt down here around in the bottom uh, amongst rocks or gravel uh, substrate. Family is marine freshwater distribution, primarily the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, they're kind of a cool water fish. Um, and so these things do like the cooler water. They're not as much into tropics. Uh, they're, they're more Northern Hemisphere, so a little bit cooler water. And so that's family caught today. We got a chat here. I don't know, is it? I don't remember where I got this image. It might be. It might be, you can Google, Google, reverse Google search that image. Tell me what it is. So, moving on. Family Perciforms or Perciformes. Uh, most diverse group of vertebrates on the face of the earth. 9,300 species, 148 families, 18 suborders. Three suborders the percoids, the labroids, and gobioids account for three quarters of all fish species here. So, this is really when we talk about vertebrate diversity. I mean, this is it, ladies and gentlemen. Order Perciformes is the pinnacle of the fishes. I mean, this is the top. Most are marine shore fishes. They predominate the vertebrate group on the continental shelf. So a lot of times in these, these coastal or shoreline areas, um, both marine and freshwater. <clears throat> so when we talked about how life originally started in the oceans, and then moved into fresh water. Like we see a lot of like order Siluriformes, the catfishes, the cyprinids, like the carps and the minnows are fresh water. We're sort of seeing a radiation back out into the marine environment here with diverse, look at all these different forms. You know, we're reinventing eel-like bodies again. Uh, we got some crazy body shapes. We got fast swimming stuff, uh, lots of variation here. The pelvic fins, have one spine and five or less soft rays. So when we look at these pelvic fins, one spine and five or fewer soft rays. Almost always have spines in the dorsal fin. This dorsal fin almost always has spines in it. And guess what? The anterior fin, the one closest to the head, has spines. The posterior one, soft rays. Sometimes they're connected. Sometimes they're notched, but, and sometimes they're separate, but dorsal fin, anterior has spines, posterior soft rays. They almost always have tenoid scales. All right, cycloid scales, we're not gonna be looking at those anymore. Only tenoid scales here. So again, those scales with little tenai, they give it kind of a rough feel, uh, or they're naked. Sometimes they're completely scaleless, or they're kind of crazy, like puffers or something like that where they've got like spikes. Swim bladder is physocleist. So there is no connection. The physostomous swim bladder is the one that connects to the esophagus. All of the persiforms are physocleists, meaning the swim bladder does not connect to the esophagus. The only way they can be filled is with oxygen obtained directly from the blood. In some cases, the swim bladder is entirely absent. It's, it's regressed, it's gone. And so a lot of times benthic fishes that don't need to have a swim bladder, they don't need buoyancy, they don't need one. They just get rid of it. Uh, the theme here is this, fewer bony elements and a high proportion of muscle. Okay, this results in improved burst swimming. These things, despite how ridiculous they might look, they swim very fast. Again, I always tell you, a narrow caught a peduncle with a deeply forked tail usually is an indication something can swim fast. It might look kind of obnoxious, but these things can relatively swim relatively quickly. So what, the, what this means is a less of a skeleton, less armor means less weight, and then more muscle means you can swim fast. So the pinnacle of evolution here is high maneuverability, high speed, low armor. We're not worried about some predator eating us because we're just going to outswim it. We're gonna get out of the way. 
We don't need to worry about it. And if they try to eat us, what we're going to do is we do have a bunch of spikes on us. So we're not going to be pleasant to eat is, is sort of the other thing. Also, because there's a lot fewer bones and there's a lot more muscle, they actually, these fishes always make good fillets. So uh, a lot of times, you know, what we call marine white fleshed species, whether they're cultured or whether they're caught in commercial fisheries, a lot of times these fish are very good eating because of this characteristic. And so uh, they're oftentimes very highly sought after uh, for human consumption, things like a, a mahi or something like this. And so uh, these are, are very good eating fish for that reason. And it's because of their evolution, right? And so perchiform, perchiform means perch-like. So those are our, our forms there. So we're looking here, suborder Percoidea. Again, here is our tree. We just finished up talking about scorp uh, scorpaniformes. Now we're into Persiforms or Percoformes. Large suborder, 2,800 species, 71 families. Contains many colorful species. So many colorful. So here's our first, uh, again, uh, actually a good eating fish here. Snooks. Um, the common snook here, the central pomus uh is the genus percoidea family central pomidae the snooks and i always remember these things they got this nice dark stripe down the side and then the dark stripe actually runs through the caudal fin so i always remember that bass like or perch like with a pike head it's got kind of a very and again when we talk about this really advanced jaw remember the underslung jaw you know this thing is a pretty good predator because it's got that nice evolved jaw, right? This is a very good predator. Large mouth protruding lower jaw. Coastal piscivore found in bays and estuaries. Lateral line is pigmented and again, extends all the way through the edge of the caudal fin. Dorsal fin is deeply notched or distinctly separate. So our posterior dorsal fin, again, soft rays, anterior dorsal fin close to the head, hard protective spines. Broadcast spawners, they, they have fertilization outside of the body, uh, release their eggs in the water column, no parental care. 22 species in the family, uh, central pomidae. Max size, six and a half feet, 440 pounds. So they get to be a good size, good size fish. Again, piscivore that eat other fish. Worldwide marine brackish, uh, freshwater distribution in Africa uh, in the tropical areas. So family, central pomidae. Uh, the snooks, good eating fish. Now, this next family, I'm going to be honest with you guys. When we set up the final, when we set up the exam, whether it's exam two or whether it's the final exam, there's going to be maybe a multiple choice question on there about family Morona Day. And I'm going to tell you this if you get this question wrong, your the final score on your exam is zero. Uh, I'm just sorry about that. If you get this fish wrong, I, I don't know how to tell it. It, it, it. You know, it's just, it's ridiculous for you to do. Family Morona Day, the temperate basses. All right, these are what we call the true basses. You know, people call like largemouth bass a bass. Uh, largemouth bass are really a sunfish. Uh, these are the true temperate basses. So <clears throat> Morona Day, again, know this one. Deeply notched dorsal fin. Anyone who's been spined by these things are not venomous, but man, they do hurt. These are very sharp, prominent. And when I talk about how defensive these things are, anyone who's handled striped bass can tell you, yes, this dorsal fin is not to be trifled with. And also they've got a preopercular spine here that can do some, some pretty severe damage too. If you, if you catch one of these things and you release it, definitely watch out. Uh, two spines on that, that opercle, uh, again, the preopercular spines. Lateral line extends uh, into the caudal fin, compressed uh, and moderate to deep bodied. So things like the white bass are, are deeper bodied. Things like the striped bass are a little bit more uh, narrow or, or streamlined. Medium to large size, you know, uh, striped bass can get pretty big, you know, six and a half foot. 100 pounds, you know, are, are what we're looking at for like some of the world records here. Six species of temperate basses, uh, family Moronidae. Really, we got the striped bass, white bass, uh, yellow bass, and the white perch in North America. And then you got things like 
the European sea bass in the Mediterranean. Broadcast spawners into vegetation or over bottom, their eggs are semi-pelagic, external fertilization, no parental care. Important sport fish. Uh, this is actually probably one of the most important recreational fisheries in North America. I think by value, it might be the number one recreational sport fishery in North America. Diet, piscivore, they eat aquatic insects. Uh, these things will eat blue crabs, uh, crustaceans, and squids. One of the nicknames here of the striped bass, you know, is, is striper, but also they're called squid hounds because uh, they'll eat squid. Um, and so in the early phases of culturing striped bass, they actually added squid oil to the diet to make it more palatable when we were trying to feed train the stripers. So they, they like squid oil. Brackish freshwater marine anadromous. Uh, striped bass is anadromous, uh, lives in the ocean, spawns in freshwater rivers. The white bass is strictly freshwater. And, you know, for instance, we can cross these fish in this genus, Moronidae, to make hybrids. And you can make hybrids with all these different things. White bass by striped bass, striped bass by white perch, yellow bass by white bass. You, you can make all sorts of hybrids. So this is a very plastic family, Moronidae. And again, the European sea bass is the counterpart in Europe. The only difference is it looks just like a striped bass, but it has no stripes. Other than that, it literally looks just like this, just no stripes. So this European sea bass. So I'm gonna show you now a video. It's kind of a long video, but we've only got a couple more slides left to go for this lecture. Um, and so this is a lecture I gave, or a, a seminar I gave on striped bass uh, last year, I believe. So here I am talking about striped bass aquaculture in the United States. And this is a doc I delivered to NOAA. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me in the back? Excellent. Thank you. Um, so as Paul said today, I'm going to talk about the uh, striped bass industry. Um, I also represent the U.S. hybrid striped bass industry. And I'd like to just um, introduce the idea here to remind everybody that the hybrid striped bass industry began in the 1980s uh, as a replacement product for the striped bass, which had crashed as a commercial fishery. Um, and the idea was to raise hybrid striped bass because it was more economically feasible at the time. However, the target animal was really the striped bass. Um, this was uh, work by early pioneers such as Ron Hodson and uh, Reggie Harrell. And right now, the U.S. hybrid striped bass industry is a $50 million a year U.S. Um, farm gate value. Um, without belaboring details here, entire books are written on the culture of striped bass and hybrid striped bass. So technical feasibility of culturing the animals is not a problem. Uh, it's really more about market uh, and economics of raising the animals profitably. So there's really no question is to can we raise these fish? The answer is yes. Um, so to briefly summarize some major uh, components here that are considerations for raising striped bass in culture. The first is uh, when we look at earthen ponds, striped bass do not tolerate warm temperatures like their hybrid counterpart. Really the upper thermal maximum here is about 28 degrees centigrade and so that means earthen pond culture in the southeast U.S. is probably out. Um, the striped bass can handle these warmer culture temperatures during their first year, but once they reach year two, they do not survive uh, warmer temperatures. Um, they're a very good candidate for recirculating or flow through aquaculture because they're a relatively high value animal. And so because these uh, recirculating is a more expensive form of culture, uh, they're a good candidate for that. And however, as far as offshore culture, there's a lot of permitting issues and regulatory concerns with striped bass because it has a very complex regulatory system. Um, and so striped bass are confusing in that regard. Uh, water chemistry, uh, the bonus to striped bass is that it is urihaline. You can grow it in fresh water, salt water, marine brackish water, it doesn't matter. They drew relatively well in all types of salinity. Um, uh, they require about eight to 10 part per thousand salt prior to, during, and after handling to mitigate stress. And really the major requirement here is that they do require hard water. Um, they don't do very well with soft water, and so 200 part per million is recommended uh, for the striped bass. And even though they're urihaline, juveniles must be a few grams before they're stocked in marine water. Uh, typically, they're raised in fresh water during the earliest part of the, of the culture. And also, I'm going to talk now about the domestication of the striped bass and to know that even though methods of, of culture have been demonstrated for striped bass, 
this was using animals that were wild origin striped bass. And we've domesticated the fish now for six generations. They're more tolerant to handling, they're more tolerant to culture, and so a lot of these studies need to be revisited um, because we believe the animals will grow better and at higher densities. Um, the striped bass is one of the priority species for the National Animal Genome Program, the NRSP8. Uh, the genome for the striped bass has been sequenced. Um, also, there is a national breeding program for the striped bass um, that I coordinate with Adam Fuller from the USDA ARS, and also we involve the U.S. hybrid striped bass industry in this, and we disseminate fish currently to the U.S. hybrid striped bass industry. Um, the striped bass genome is publicly available. You can download it from NCBI. Uh, uh, Linnea, uh, my graduate student Linnea Anderson and Jason Abernathy from USDA ARS are going to present this next door in about a half an hour, uh, the striped bass and white bass genomes, which we've completed to 24 linkage group resolution, which is a very good tool for selective breeding and also research on the animals. Um, Andy McGinty, uh, Adam Fuller and I run the national breeding program for the U.S. hybrid striped bass industry. We have sixth generation domestic striped bass, tenth generation domestic white bass, these are available uh, to the industry primarily for use to produce hybrid striped bass uh, uh, by farmers across the country. However, nothing stops us from using this domesticated animal uh, to supply a domestic striped bass industry as well. So if you're interested, uh, please contact Andy McGinty. Anyone who's trying to get a hold of me is very difficult, so I apologize. This is not a new concept. Uh, Eric Hallerman back in 1994, this is a good paper talking about economic feasibility of establishing a domestic breeding program for, for uh, striped bass. And so this goes back 20 or more years, uh, including Ron, work by Ron Hodson, Curry Woods, and also my advisor, Craig Sullivan. Uh, to give you a background, the domestic striped bass is based on about 400 founder crosses of striped bass representing uh, gen uh, geographic lineages across the Atlantic U.S. seaboard, including uh, Florida Gulf of Mexico. These fish were all collapsed into one gen gen uh, genetically homogenous broodstock. We raise four-year classes um, every year of striped bass, age one, two, three, and four. And we start off with thousands of fingerlings. We try to make about a hundred or so different distinct families each year. Um, and we cross then males and females and then provide animals then also to the industry for these hybrid crosses. So we've got several hundred families on the station um, and we try to make a hundred each year. Um, technology for sperm cryovasorate preservation has also been reported. Um, we've also stored germplasm at the USDA Animal Germplasm Research, uh, Repository. These are the equivalent of second and third generation domesticated striped bass, so we need to get a more updated sample in there from the sixth generation domesticated stripers. And again, this is mostly work done by Curry Woods. So we've got sperm cryopreservation protocols established. Recently, we've developed methods to spawn striped bass in mass where we don't use any hormones at all, and we can produce millions of fry. Um, we, we usually batch what we call batch spawn 20 or more of each gender in large tanks and then just harvest the eggs out. So we've, we've eliminated strip spawning. We've also eliminated the use of HCG and GNRH. And this is data that I presented uh, the last year or the year before here at this meeting. We also have genotyped the animals and we find that there's very good genetic mixing here. The, the animals are quite promiscuous. Uh, males and females will, will reproduce with several of each gender. Um, with this last year, 2018, we produced about 16 million fry, again, eliminating the use of GNRH analog and also HCG. So 16 million fry produced in 2018 uh, using these no hormone group spawns, and we're currently working to get this, these data published. Um, I'm now going to move into selective breeding for particular traits. These are several of the traits that we've been breeding for over the last, say, 20 years. Uh, this complete list is published here uh, in this book edited by Hongping Wang, but I'm going to talk here about smaller head size with improved dress out weight and also faster growth with improved feed efficiency. So David Berlinski up at University of New Hampshire compared the domestic striped bass with several strange and wild origin striped bass. The domestic striped bass and, and, and wild origin Florida fish actually perform the best. We can get a, a three pound fish within about 17 months at uh, marine conditions at 20 to 21 degrees centigrade, RAS, and we can get a five pound fish in about 24 months. Um, so the domestic fish do very well in culture of, in RAS conditions. We replicated this study in North Carolina State University, again in RAS, but this was at uh, close to fresh water, so five part per thousand or less. And again, we can achieve a three pound fish here in about 500 days. 
Um, Curry Woods and David Berlinski also compared feed uh, conversion ratio of striped bass in different salinities, so marine, freshwater, and brackish water. We can see significantly better feed conversion uh, ratio of the domesticated fish compared to wild origin fish from Virginia, Florida, and Canada. Uh, and so even though the Florida fish might grow as well as the domestic striped bass in culture, we see a much improved feed conversion ratio in the domestic animals. And these data were also presented in 2016 Aquaculture America. So when we look at improving dress out weight, we've been breeding for smaller head size. So up here is a, a wild striped bass. Note the size of the gape of the mouth here and the length of the head versus the domestic striped bass. They've got a much smaller head. Um, this improves the uh, dress out weight of uh, the filet. So we're working with a, a local seafood, which is a seafood distributor located in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, and they process wild striped bass because it's a fishery in the state of North Carolina along with our domesticated fish. This is an example of one of our processed fillets here, um, processed by local seafood. And also we work with chefs and restaurants around the Raleigh-Durham area. Um, and so the, the striped bass are processed here and we also um, poll the chefs to find out information such as what is the desired product size, like what size fish do they want. Uh, this restaurant here was recently voted uh, best restaurant in the Raleigh-Durham area. Maybe it's because of the delicious striped bass they serve, I'm not sure. I, I, can't, I can't say that for sure. So things we found is this. The preferred market size is a three to six pound fish. All right, the restaurant chefs want this. Um, this is for a skin on filet, rib out, and this is some uh, seafood filets here from local seafood in the Raleigh Farmer's Market. Retail here this last summer was $18 a pound for that. Um, and again, they process all sorts of wild fish along with our domestics, and so we can say that our what we call domestic mediums have about a half a percent better filet dress out yield, and our large fish have about a four percent better filet dress out yield. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that um, the fish are commercially harvested during the spawning run, and so females have a large gonad at that time. So there's a lot of row there. Um, and we've also assumed we're trying to figure out what the farm gate value would be for this. You know, the hybrid striped bass industry, we're looking at about a $3.85 per pound farm gate value. However, striped bass are probably going to be able to fetch $5 or more a pound based upon our, our work here and our preliminary uh, experiments there. So you can buy frozen farm-raised striped bass fillets of Whole Foods. Uh, Love the Wild distributes these fish, and so this is the product labeling for this. And so as far as the size of the market, it's pretty large. So these, these are currently available at Whole Foods, farm-raised striped bass. Um, and when we look at uh, a few other considerations for striped bass, I'd like to point out policy and permitting. So when we look at the NOAA um, Gulf of Mexico uh, offshore cage mariculture initiative, Striped bass are not, it's not legal to culture striped bass in this situation as far as I'm concerned, right, or as far as I know right now. So it's been accidentally omitted and so it's, no, it's not a candidate for this, which then leaves uh, uh, permitting then for Atlantic Eastern U.S. aquaculture offshore. And there's considerations with that as well as far as the sport fishery and possession of striped bass and offshore. Um, it's a consideration here. And so there needs, this needs to be figured out before we really can pursue this with striped bass. Um, this uh, recent uh, Aqua Act introduced by Senator Wicker, we'll see what, what goes on with that, but this is also uh, working towards the, that direction of, of helping this out. So that leaves us then with recirculating aquaculture, which is where our efforts have been di directed because of the uncertainty here with offshore. And this is a newspaper article from, two, from, from January of this year. This is a farm in Connecticut that's raising Dyson Trarchus Labrax, the European sea bass. Now this is a non-native fish, but it's in family Moronidae. It is a striped bass, it's just a European version of it. And so this indicates then that, that RAS, circular, or RAS culture of striped bass is, is, is very possible. When we look at disease incidence in striped bass, really other than opportunistic pathogens, we're looking at VHS, viral hemorrhagic septicemia. This was a big deal 10 or more years ago, um, and it's really located here around the Great Lakes region. It really, I haven't heard much about it uh, for several years, and our advice here, we've got domesticated fish, come to us, don't get them from Lake Michigan or Lake Erie, right? So come get our fish. And so with that, I'd like to show our collaborations here. We work directly with USDA ARS. Uh, Carl Webster is the director of the Harry K. Priest Duck Garden National Aquaculture Research Center. Adam Fuller and Jason Abernathy are the geneticists and the physiologists here who work on the hybrid striped bass industry, again, with striped bass. And then Andy McGinty and myself run the uh, domesticated breeding program here at North Carolina State University. And also we have facilities here for uh, doing larval rearing and um, uh, studies. 
And I'm not going to go over these, this bulleted list, but this is provided in the abstracts. It's a, it's a list of strengths and weaknesses for the, the striped bass. That um, is sort of a summary of what we've gone over here. And just to point out that we are sort of looking at intensive larval rearing of striped bass with USDA and uh, SRAC. And I'd like to encourage everybody to promote and not permit the aquaculture industry. I think this is an important concept. We can't just say we can do this. We want to say we will do this. Um, and so with that, these are my um, co-authors, colleagues, and research collaborators, uh, in particular Harry Daniels, Russell Borsky, Steve Hall, uh, Ron Hodson, of course, is still involved with this, uh, Curry Woods and David Berlinski, um, and then my uh, stakeholders and funding support for the striped bass and uh, hybrid striped bass industry in the U.S. So with that, I'll entertain questions if I've got time, Paul. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> so that is Family Morona Day. Remember to not get that question wrong on the exam. All right. Family Morona Day. The temperate basses, including the striped bass. Next family, family Serranidae, the sea basses. So your example here, black sea bass, Centropristis striata. Uh, you will have to know that one for your lab. Three spines on the operculum. So again, you can sort of see these, these three spikes here, uh, these preopercular spines. Again, this is sort of heavy armor, and look at that. The dorsal fin's pretty nasty looking. Again, uh, very sharp, defensive. Lateral line uh, ends here in the caudal peduncle. So it ends here at the end of the caudal peduncle. It does not go through the caudal fin. Uh, the dor dorsal fin is continuous in most species of family Serranidae. Uh, again, with the anterior portion of it, uh, hard spines, posterior portion, soft rays. Uh, the scales are tenoid in, in, some, in most species. This is kind of a throwback. A few species in the family Serranidae do have cycloid scales, but I think this is maybe the last time we're going to see that. These are hermaphrodites, uh, both sequential, meaning uh, one gender before the other, and also then simultaneous, uh, meaning that they're both males and females simultaneously, and they can cross fertilize in the dwarf sea basses. So sequential, these things like groupers and sea basses, which are part of the Serranidae, they're what we call protogenous. Proto, first, gene means woman or female. So protogene means, a protogeny means female first, and then they become a male. Um, one species, the Nassau grouper, is bisexual as a young, and then uh, as they become adults, they became uh, gonorchists uh, or gonochoristic, which means that they are uh, two, two in, uh, one gender for uh, males, or it, fish are either male or female. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, 450 species, one uh, of the largest fish families actually at 450 fish species. Broadcast spawners, no parental care, fertilization is external. These things just release the, the eggs out. Max size, 10 feet, 880 pounds. So these things get relatively large. Uh, family marine in all tropic and temperate waters, and so their distribution is pretty wide. So this is family Serranidae, the sea basses. Uh, hermaphrodites are a key feature here, spines in the anal fin, and also preopercular spines is another one. Um, and so that are the, those are the characteristics there, family Serranidae. Uh, here are some examples of Serranids, uh, grouper, sea basses, and the dwarf sea basses. So look at this. The Warsaw grouper, record, record weight, 418 pounds. Look at the size of this fish, it's a pretty good size. Here's the gag grouper, about three feet long, uh, max size. Um, here is the scamp grouper, uh, about one and a half feet. Um, uh, Micteroperca is the genus, and Micteroperca up here as well. Centropristis, uh, black sea bass male, is about 18 inches. And they got this kind of characteristic uh, caudal fin. As always, I look at the, uh, the, this black sea bass always has that characteristic caudal fin. And here's the belted sandfish, Serranus, only three inches. So lots of variation here. They can be really big and really small. So those are your serranid examples. 
One of my favorite families here, Family Centrarchidae, the sunfishes. Uh, also, you know, like the largemouth bass, Micropterus salmoides, they call these the black basses. Again, not to be confused with the true temperate basses, genus Moronidae. These are the black basses. Uh, really, they're sunfishes. Uh, family Centrarchidae, moderate to uh, moderately deep to very deep and laterally compressed body. So, you know, the, the, the large mouth can be kind of narrow, but sometimes they're pretty deep body here, uh, almost round. Uh, continuous dorsal fin, sometimes there's a notch, like for instance, uh, there's a notch here between the anterior and posterior dorsal fin in the large mouth bass, whereas in other sunfishes, you don't see that. You might see a little bit of a notch here. Uh, as usual, anterior dorsal fin, hard spines, posterior, soft rays. A lateral line is present. In some cases, it's incomplete, so it doesn't go all the way down the sides of the body, but you can see the lateral line very prominently here going, to the caudal, uh, going through the caudal peduncle here. Tenoid scales in most. I don't really know of any examples of sunfishes that have cycloid scales, so tenoid scales here most. Males build nests. Uh, and then the females come through and lay eggs on the nests. The males then fertilize those and then guard the eggs until they hatch. And even after the, the fry hatch, they sort of hang around this nest and the male guards them. And so anyone who's gone fishing might have seen something like this. These are male sunfish, looks like bluegill probably, sitting on these gravel nests guarding the eggs. And so these are all males. And they have to be so many feet apart because these guys are very territorial. The males will fight with each other over the nest area. And they're also very defensive. If, you, if, a, if a fish comes in here, they will chase it off. Uh, max size, three feet, 26 pounds for the largemouth bass. Fresh waters of North America are where the central orchids are. I'm going to show a video here of the sunfish nests. But, you know, a lot of times fishermen will go out there and try to catch these things. And... You know, every now and then I think you might be able to snag a sunfish, but I'm going to give you a little clue. Anyone who goes and tries to catch the male sunfish off a, of, off a nest, they don't eat during this time. They actually fast. So if you cast a lure out here and drag it by, the fish isn't going to strike it to eat it. It might strike it to chase it away, but usually it, it sort of knocks it away. And so, like, if you were to, say, jerk that hook and snag the fish, you might be able to do that. But rarely, they don't really eat during this time. So every now and then, I see a bunch of these guys going out trying to fish for the fish on the nests because they're very easy to see from the shoreline. But, yeah, they're really not, they don't really eat during this time. So here's a sunfish nest video, and you can sort of see the male uses his caudal fin to sort of sweep out these uh, these nests. And we talk about like the uh, fin placement and the, look, look how maneuverable these fish are and how fast they can move and how agile they are. And notice it can just sort of hang in the water column because it has a swim bladder that it's got its own buoyancy control. So again, very sophisticated design. And like this, they'll, they'll sort of chase stuff away from their nest, but that's really what they're doing. And that's sort of the behavior, hanging out on the nest, uh, defending it. A lot of other fish will try to come in there to eat the eggs or something like that. And so the, the, the males will protect them, the, the, the offspring. So there are the eggs down there. You can sort of see uh, these are the little fry in there hatching out. Uh, you can sort of see their yolk sacs and their little bodies. Those are the little larval uh, sunfish. And the male will guard those guys as well until they're able to freely swim and feed on their own. So these things just sort of hang around down there. The male guards them. 
And so here's a bunch of sunfish there sitting over gravel nests. And again, they just sort of swim around the perimeter, chase things off. And here are some abandoned nests. Like there's a largemouth bass swimming by the bluegill. And they use their fins, they use their pectoral fins and the caudal fin then to also fan the nest to make sure they've got good, like, good fresh water circulation over there so those things stay uh, nice and oxygenated, the eggs and the larvae. But here they are just hanging around in their nests, all the males guarding the nests. And really all the females do is they just come up, lay their eggs on there, and then the males will fertilize, and then they'll guard. So that is the sunfishes, the nest builders. I always remember, they're very characteristic nest building, and there's pretty good parental care. You can sort of see those, those males do tend the nest very well. Now, I will say this. I, I did forget to show a video here uh, of the groupers, the, I got a, 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 a NASA grouper video that I'll show here for the previous family, family Serranidae. So I'll show that video right now. And then we've got one more family of fishes to talk about, and then I have a story. So here are some NASA groupers congregating and spawning at night. You see these groupers. <clears throat> And look at them all. There's a bunch. You see there, there's a spawning event. They almost group spawn like that where it's, uh, you know, uh, several, uh, you know, males will, for instance, chase a female and she'll release her eggs and then they'll all sort of simultaneously fertilize it like that. Several, several uh, individuals will participate. And look at that. If you want that job, they're swimming into that to collect a sample. We need some grad students to do that. I think remote Matt, that's your next uh, project. Um, and so those are the spawning groupers. Uh, family serenity. And so our last family, uh-oh, uh we got, uh, this is remote mass responding. Brutal. <laughs> Come on, brutal. I like it. <laughs> uh, I won't, I, I will not mention that to your advisor as uh, your next potential project. But that's pretty good. I mean, uh, that's what you could ask you know, ask my graduate students because that's we do a lot of reproduction work on on fish. So it's usual. All right, so here, family Percidae, the perches. Uh, Percidae, perch, easy one for me to remember. Uh, also, one of the most characteristic families. You know, it includes things like the darters, the perches, and apex predators such as the walleye. Uh, used to be genus uh, Schizostedon, now it's genus, this is not Sander, it's, it's, it's pronounced Xander with a Z, Xander Vitreus, the walleye. Uh, it's two separated dorsal fins, again, anterior hard spiny, posterior soft rays. I'm going to repeat this over and over again because it's going to be a key characteristic for all these uh, persiform fishes. One to two anal spines. The second spine, if present, is actually longer than the first one. 
Pelvic fins are thoracic, again, keeping with this trend. Pelvic fins and, and pectoral fins, very well associated with one another. 162 species. There's actually quite a bit of diversity here, given primarily to the darters. Uh, major freshwater family in North Hemisphere. Uh, North America, for instance, you know, you see these things, cold water. Uh, darters are oftentimes found in streams, rivers, and creeks. Um, major group, second most diverse family in North America. The most diverse family of fishes in North America are the cyprinids. Second most is actually family percadae. 150 species, and again, most are darters. Three family subgroups, the perches like yellow perch, percaflobescens, walleyes like the walleye and the pike perches or the, uh, the sauger, and then the darters, these little guys. These are very small, colorful fish that live in, in, in little rivers and creeks. The perch subgroup, here it is, perch, uh, yellow perch, percaflobescens. Again, cold water fish, you know, for instance, up in the Great Lakes. Strong serrated preoperculum, compressed body, well-developed swim bladder. Uh, perch spawn sticky ribbons of eggs like this. They're adhesive and they sort of form these sticky ribbons that sit on the bottom. And the yellow, per, uh, the salger here. Again, Xander canadensis. How do you tell the difference between a salger and a wall? They look pretty similar. Well, number one, this thing's got a white spot on the bottom margin of its caudal fin not present here on the sauger. And also look at these spots here on the dorsal fin. Oftentimes the walleye doesn't have it. So those are sort of key features for your lab if you're trying to tell the difference between a walleye and a sauger. Walleye subgroup, weak anal spines. So there's not a lot of heavy spines in the anal fin. Lateral line extends into the caudal fin, very well-developed swim bladder, female broadcast eggs in shallow water, no parental care, largest in the group, 36 inches. So about three feet. So that's the walleye subgroup. Here are the darters. Again, these little guys. Look at how colorful these guys are. Here's the rainbow darter, ethiostoma. And look at this, ethiostoma, 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 ethiostoma is the genus. Smooth preopercular margin, moderate uh, anal fin spine here. Swim bladder is reduced or absent. You see these guys, they live on the bottom, oftentimes in streams and rivers. Mainly freshwater, lotic species, again, riverine. Eggs are deposited on vegetation, sometimes they're adhesive. So here are some adhesive rock, uh, eggs attached to a rock. Male often has bright nuptial colors. Sometimes they're drab, but oftentimes they're bright. Smallest in the group, two inch, you know, really, uh, they range from two to seven inches. And so darters are restricted in their distributions and subject to habitat changes and then many have received federal endangered or threatened status. A lot of times these things like clean, clear water in creeks and oftentimes uh, water pollution, siltation, things like that, uh, they do not tolerate this. And so a lot of these things are, are, are small riverine fishes, oftentimes really the southeast part of the United States and really to, to some extent the Mississippi River systems on the uh, west side of the Appalachian Mountains are where a lot of darters are. And a lot of those are, are in periled areas, you know? Um, and so these guys sometimes struggle, but they're very pretty, uh, very pretty riverine fishes, very brilliantly colored. And so that is family percadet. Lots of variation there, perches, walleyes, and then these darters. So with that, I have a story. <clears throat> and again, this story here, is on the striped bass. <laughs> so again, you might have a question about striped bass, family Moronidae, and then here's a story about it. So you learned it here, AEC 441, striped bass of California. So striped bass are popular sport fish, like I said, probably the number one recreational species in the country. East coast of the United States, Atlantic Ocean. They are found from the Gulf of the St. Lawrence River all the way down into Alabama. All right, they're in the Gulf of Mexico. They, they don't really circumvent the tip of the Florida. Uh, there is the Gulf of Mexico population is distinct from what we call the Atlantic population. And we just recently published a study. We know they're actually farther north here. They're actually farther north in distribution now, uh, north of the Bay of Fundy. 
So they're already they're all the way up into uh, New Brunswick, Canada. Um, partly due to the fact that the 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 Gulf Stream has warmed the Atlantic Ocean, so they've actually extended their northern distributions. Anyhow, that's kind of an aside. Uh, striped bass were introduced into the Pacific Ocean, west coast of the United States back in 1879. Now, 132 bass were brought successfully from California by train um, to the Navasink River, in, or from the Navasink River in New Jersey, released near Martinez, California. And fish from that lot were then caught within a year uh, near Salicito, Alameda, and Monterey, California. So within a year, they had sort of, uh, they, they were, they were, they were recaught. So we knew that they had survived. Now, this is one of the first actions, actually, of what was called the Fish and Game Commission. Now, the Fish and Game Commission, uh, or, the, uh, the, or the first commissioner of the U.S. Fish and Fisheries, you know, this is what then be eventually became the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, so U.S. FWS. One of the first things they did, put a bunch of striped bass on a train, send it across the, the entire United States and, and dump these fish into the Pacific Ocean. So the, the commission then thought that, the, that there was such a small number of bass in this initial uh, truckload or train load that they might fail to establish. And so they, it, they had a second introduction of about 300 stripers made in the lower uh, Suisun Bay in 1882. So about three years later, they sent another 300 fish out to the Pacific and dumped them in. So those stockings were actually conducted under the supervision of Spencer F. Baird, the first commissioner of the essentially U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. He served from 1871 to 1887. You can see these, these striped bass from back in the day, you know, very long stripers. It's hard to find them this big anymore, I'll tell you. Uh, within a few years, striped bass were being caught <clears throat> relatively routinely and in large numbers and by 1889, bass were being sold in San Francisco seafood markets. So they had established and there was a fishery for them within just a few years. That, that, what is this, 10 years? So in 1935, all commercial fishing for striped bass was stopped in the belief that this would enhance the recreational sport fishery. And really, in the United States, post-World War II, uh, so uh, 40s into the 50s, you see a lot of uh, support for recreational fishing as a hobby and also for people to obtain food in the United States. And so this was sort of a trend uh, post-World War II nationally. But in the case of the striped bass in California, uh, they stopped the commercial fishery back in 1935. And so it's right now, it's, it's to this day, I believe, only a recreational fishery in the state of California. So... Little did you know, striped bass are in fact an exotic species in California. As much as we like them here on the East Coast, they're an introduction in California, West Coast, and they're found in the Pacific. So that is your story for today. You learned it here. So with that, I am going to stop recording and then I will entertain questions. Stop recording.